you know, this session is probably a little bit more, it's a bit more intuitive than some of the other sessions that we've been looking at. It's not particularly technical uh, for the most part. So what we're talking about here is the concept of substance. And what I'll do is I want to contextualize that. I want to explain what we're talking about, why we're talking about it. And it's probably obvious to everyone in this room why we're talking about substance, um, because what this is really about is um, if you have a structure like this, if you have some kind of structure that crosses borders, is it real? Or is it just there in name alone and in legal form alone to achieve some kind of tax benefit? And increasingly, the focus from uh, lawmakers and from the courts has been on looking at the reality of something and looking at whether there is any substance in it, whether there is any reality in it, and only if there is reality in it does that actually get the benefits of tax treaties, does that get the benefits of any special reliefs that may be available. Makes sense, yeah? Okay, so this is a substance over form type analysis. But I want to make sure we all understand what that really means, because it's all very well saying, well, we all think there needs to be proper substance in arrangements. Everyone agrees with that, or the OECD recommends that, or governments talk about it. What does it really mean in practice? And as I go through this session, we'll see what it really means in practice. It means several things in practice. Uh, one is, yeah, it's there in the OECD recommendations. And the OECD recommendations have led to there being clauses included in double tax treaties, um, clauses, limitation of benefit clauses that apply in specific circumstances. And so there are some quite specific limitation of benefit clauses, uh, uh, limitation of benefit clauses in tax treaties. For example, there's a treaty that Singapore is a signatory to that specifies exactly what a company's got to look like in order to have any substance and be real if you're going to take it into account as a company um, for the purposes of that double tax treaty. There are other double tax treaties that have a more general limitation of benefits clause that will talk about, look, is this really something in substance that exists or is this just there for the purpose of avoiding tax? What's your commercial objective? So double tax treaties is one. There's lots of anti-avoidance legislation that specifically um, talks about uh, substance. So when you look at the thin capitalization rules, when you look at the transfer pricing rules, they echo the requirement for there to be substance. And under domestic law, we're finding increasingly that courts will look at this as a concept. Um, we have under the UK law the concept of a sham. A sham is something that isn't real, uh, that's <coughs> dressed up as something, it pretends to be something, but actually when you look at it, it isn't really that. So a recent case that went through the courts looked at whether a payment to footballers was actually a payment or was it a loan. It pretended to be a loan. The court actually agree, eventually agreed it was a loan, but there was a lot of debate about whether that loan was a sham. Was it just pretending to be a loan? Of course, I was quite surprised at the judgment because there was no way these footballers were going to pay back this money, uh, is the reality. So it didn't sound like a loan to me. Um, so domestic, local, court, local jurisdictions... Uh, the courts in lots of jurisdictions are focusing on this as a concept. Um, but, so what I want to do in this session is look at what we mean by substance, look at where it's actually manifesting itself, how that's actually appearing in different documents and in different um, uh, recommendations that are coming out from the OECD and in different bits of law, international law, like double tax agreements and domestic law, like some of the anti-avoidance rules, and how that affects us. And then I'll, I'll pick on... Uh, Holland. Who have we got here from Holland? We have at least one participant from Holland. So I'll look at um, something that's quite useful guidance in the context of Dutch companies. But, you know, um, this can be guidance for any kind of arrangement. So, um, like I said, I'm going to be looking at what I say the new substance rules. Well, what are these rules? Whose rules are they? Well, there are the recommendations from the OECD about what countries should be doing. There are domestic anti-avoidance rules that echo the requirement for there to be substance. And then, I'll, and, and there are double tax treaty rules limiting the benefits of double tax treaties where there isn't substance. Then we'll look at some things like a holding company, we'll look at an intellectual property company in IPCO, and we'll look at a finance company. And we'll look at structures involving each of those 
And between us, I'll get a bit of audience participation required here this time, guys. Uh, between us, we'll decide how the substance rules and how the substance um, considerations can apply to that. And we will look at specific anti-avoidance rules and where substance is appearing in the context of those rules. And this comes down to action five of the BEPS plan. And the recommendation here was that basically laws, um, international and domestic, should take more account. If, they want, if you're wanting to counter harmful tax practices, these laws should take more account of the reality of what is going on in a particular transaction, the substance of what a transaction is. Um, and there should be sufficient transparency to mean that you can identify that. And this really focused on IP. And it wasn't only that lots of different countries had generous regimes in respect of deductibility for expenses in generating IP. It was that lots of people, as we know, the Google example obviously is one we all know, lots of people were exploiting the fact that it was easy to put your IP somewhere, to charge for the use of their IP, to reduce your domestic tax base as a result of that without there being any corresponding tax charge somewhere else. It was easy, even with the presence of transfer pricing regimes, it was easy to use that and to use IP in that way to really exploit lots of countries' tax systems. So the real focus was on IP. And this is, you know, this is a great example, isn't it, of how the world moves on and sort of tax regimes try and keep up with it. Uh, if you remember the 15 BEPS changes that are put, can you remember what the first BEPS action related to? on that 15 list, a little memory test for you. The prize of a Cramerich Leicester City shirt for anyone who gives me the right answer. Oh, no, I've already given that away, haven't I? Uh, so I can't give you that. Um, anyone remember what that first action was, what it related to? It related to the digital economy. And the, uh, alongside it, it was no action yet taken because no one really knows what to do about that yet because the world is commercially going a little faster than tax regimes can keep up with. Well, we're just catching up with the IP Point. We're just catching up with the fact that, what, in the last decade, a ridiculously large value can be attributed to the intellectual property of a company like Google. What has it got? All it's got is the clever stuff it's produced in terms of algorithms that mean we have an, an immensely powerful search engine. That's all it's got. Uh, just something that could reside in somebody's head. Well, the tax system's only just catching up with that, really, and we're, we're yet, it's yet to catch up with the digital economy. And it's a great example of that. And so these rules, the substance push, focused on um, intellectual property, but more recently it started looking at different things as well. Um, and, well, I say more recently, I mean, finance companies are a good example. A finance company, I'll give an example of a Dutch finance company in a bit. A Dutch finance company, lots of structures would use this. Would that work nowadays? Well, we've got some reasonable information on that, uh, which we can share with you about how effective we think that might be. And it's dead simple. What the OECD want, what pretty much all jurisdictions and all governments want, is they don't mind you having access to lower rates of tax. They don't mind you having access to a system which limits the tax base. They don't mind you having access to a, a favourable payment and repayment system like you've got in Malta, so you've, you're taxed at a high rate of corporation tax, but you get it all back when you pay a dividend out. That is still the case, isn't it? Um, so it's effective. What's the effective rate in, in Malta? Is it still 5%? Yes, for a so th for trading companies, yeah. So that's it. Fantastic, yeah. Could be useful for our case study later on. Who knows? Um, who knows? I've got no idea personally, but who knows? Um, uh, yeah, that, that was just an example of uh, in Malta, if you have a trading company in Malta, it pays corporation tax at 35%. Well, that ain't any good, is it? Who'd go to Malta for that? But as soon as it pays a dividend out to a holding company, um, then it gets a refund of that, and you, if you end up with an effective rate of 5% overall of tax leakage from that, which is quite favourable. Um, okay, um, and an important point here is that, um, again, Nobody's wanting to rob countries of their sovereignty. Nobody's wanting to take away from countries the ability to 
agree that they can have an effective 5% rate if people come and invest in the country. Nobody's wanting to stop Ireland imposing a 12.5% corporation tax rate. That's up to each individual country. And countries will compete against each other for international capital, for international trade. They can still do that. But the point is, people only get access to that when they're really there. And what do we mean by really there? And that's the whole point of substance. It's getting to the real significance of what we actually need as a minimum to allow somebody access to a particular country's tax regime. That's what it's all about. OK. Um, and this is, um, this is how countries, I mean, this is what the international response to it is. It's an agreement that all countries should be focusing on what's really going on. This is really what I've just said. Um, and this was originally really focusing on the absolutely urgent issue of intellectual property and intellectual property being generated in different places and you not just being able to look at a transfer pricing valuation of intellectual property, which could be low if you transfer it when it's pre-revenue stage. That could be useful for the uh, case study as well. Uh, it could be low when you transfer at pre-revenue stage, rather looking at what you're spending on actually generating it and where you're spending that. Um, and the idea is that what should happen is that in the case of intellectual property, which I'll talk about now, in the case of intellectual property, you should only really be regarded as having generated that intellectual property in a jurisdiction where the activity in relation to the generation of that intellectual property takes place. So, in other words, um, uh, if you have a company that's a startup, it's got some intellectual property, it puts that intellectual property when it's got little value into a non-UK, into a sorry, into an overseas jurisdiction where the tax rate is going to be very, very low. Um, it hasn't generated it there, has it? It's only generated it there to the extent it's actually spent some money on generating it. And this is the, the principle really is just following the thing of rather than trying to identify where the activity was, because that's easy to confuse, isn't it? Oh, we spent a lot of time developing in this, spent a lot of thought time sat in Malta developing this uh, intellectual property, honestly. Uh, when we were on the beach, this is all we were thinking about. And uh, so we generated the IP there. Well, that would be easy to say, wouldn't it? Harder to prove. And the international response has been really well stuff all, sorry, forget all that. Uh, what you do is you just you show me the money. You put your money where your mouth is, as we say in the UK. In other words, it's to do with where you spend the money. And the idea is that in recognising the existence of intellectual property and the value of intellectual property and the amount of income that can be recognised for tax purposes on that intellectual property, you look uh, the intellectual property in a particular place, and you work out how much has been spent there on generating that intellectual property. And this is referred to as the nexus approach. Has anyone had to look at this in any detail? I've not. Um, but has anyone in practice had a look at this? No? OK. Um, then um, I'm afraid we're relying on my research in that case. Um, and uh, the nexus approach really is saying this. It's saying that if you put some intellectual property, if you have, if you have a situation where there's intellectual property in a particular place, um, then uh, absolutely fine. We're not going to object to that. Um, so we've got a company here. And again, let's say this company has developed a fantastic new idea. And it gives the rights to that new idea to this company over here. And this company over here is, call it Isle of Man. OK, and so this company uh, did, it started generating, it came up with the idea originally, but it gave this company all the rights over that intellectual property, OK? And you can see what's going to happen. Um, as we start generating income here, this company is going to charge, it's going to license the IP, because this company will, will sell products based on the intellectual property that exists here. Uh, it can only do that under license to this company, so it will pay lots and lots of money over here. This can be taxed on that income, and this can have a deduction for that income. Absolutely fine, but only to the extent that this has generated the, the IP itself. How do we know the extent to which it's generated the IP? It's the extent to which it's spent the money on generating the IP. So in other words, saying to the tax authorities, honestly, we spent ages developing this IP. 
Uh, we had guys over here for months and months and months. They were thinking about it. You couldn't tell, but they were thinking about it, and they generated all that IP. No, it's what you spend, and that's what the Nexus approach is about. And this, uh, this is what the recommendation of the OECD is, and this is what lots of companies are adopting. It's basically saying that what you do is you undertake a formula for identifying what this company has actually spent on developing that IP. And that might be uh, less, might be significantly less, might only be a tiny fraction of the overall cost of developing that intellectual property. Yeah? Um, now, um, th there's still, still great opportunities here, because what if, what if you spent hardly anything on developing this I IP? What if you're standing in the shower one day and you have a brilliant idea um, and actually you can allocate it to that company? Well, there, you can see that you know, pretty much you can have all your expenditure in there without any problem at all. The more realistic situation, and taking the case study, the more realistic situation is that there will have been significant expenditure undertaken on the IP, uh, and uh, where is it undertaken? Is it undertaken there or there? Only to the extent that it's undertaken there can you recognise that as income there and deduction there. Does that make sense? And the formula looks like this. You identify the qualifying expenditure incurred to develop the IP assets. You divide it by the overall expenditure incurred to develop the IP asset. What's all that mean? And you multiply that by the overall income from the asset. So here's the overall income coming in here. You look there at what does all of that qualify? Does a bit of that qualify? You look at there. You, there you apply that formula there, the qualifying expenditure incurred divided by the overall expenditure incurred. And when we're talking about IP assets, we're talking about um, basically patents or other assets that have the attributes of patents. And so these are really it, uh, what the legislation is after. It's after assets that are defendable in court. So a legal right that you can defend under some mechanism of international law. And the patent mechanism is obviously the most obvious one, uh, but it would apply to things that have a legally equal status to patents. There are certain regimes that provide uh, tax benefits just in relation to patents. The UK does. It has something called Patent Box. Luxembourg does as well. Has anybody access to Luxembourg uh, Patent Register, or whatever they call it? Anybody, anybody got experience with Luxembourg? No, well, they do actually have a uh, preferential tax regime uh, where you do have intellectual property. Uh, so Luxembourg might be one co country that somebody would look to use if you wanted to create an IP company, subject to all the things I'm saying. If you want to create an IP company, Luxembourg might be useful. That might be useful for the case study later. Who knows? Um, so what you're looking at is you're looking at the IP assets let's assume these are patents or equivalent. You're looking at the qualifying expenditure. This is the expenditure incurred by the qualifying taxpayer, there we assume, directly connected to the IP asset, but not overheads. Um, so it's the stuff they've actually paid on the R&D. It's the stuff they've paid for the salaries of the bright boffins who've come up with the algorithms. It's the stuff they've paid for the, for the uh, computer systems and the software and everything else that they needed to develop it. It's the stuff that my company paid for the lab technicians and the laboratory instruments and the autoclaves and all those different bits of kit that they use in working out whether this drug technology works. It's the direct expenses, but not the overheads. But in doing that calculation, they allow you a 30% uplift in expenditure, provided that doesn't make the qualifying expenditure more than the overall expenditure, provided you don't reverse. You, do you remember that? Provided that doesn't become two over one instead of one over two. Yeah? Um, so, uh, and that 30% uplift is to reflect the fact that in lots of high tax in jurisdictions, there's actually quite favourable tax treatment for research and development expenditure, including the UK. Do you know what deduction you can get in the UK for research and development expenditure? Does anybody know? Would it, could it be as much as 100%? It's actually 230%. Um, so if you spend, yeah, you know, if you spend um, uh, you know, 100 pounds, then you're treated as spending 230 pounds on R&D. So it's actually extremely generous. And it's not only that you get, even if you haven't got profit, you can get, and I think this was mentioned by somebody yesterday, if you don't have profit, you can uh, get a, a, a tax repayment before you've generated profit. So lots of clients I speak to take that option just in case they never get any profit. You get a bit less if you go on that option, but you can take the money up front. And the overall expenditure is everything 
that's really been spent um, on generating the IP. So it's all the overheads and everything else, all your building costs, all your uh, lighting and heating costs, all your administration costs, everything like that, that uh, if you were just claiming it in the base country, what you would be claiming um, in terms of recognising the profitability of that entity. Um, and the overall income is... Um, uh, the overall income is um, uh, you, you actually uh, uh, subtract the IP expenditure all allocable to the IP income. It's a slightly technical thing, but generally we're talking about everything that's coming from that patent, but you're knocking off what you've directly expended on the, um, on the IP income in a particular year. Um, so this is technically what the nexus ratio looks like. Um, and it's logical enough. What, what I'll just explain C and D because they're not particularly well explained on the slide. Uh, a and B are the R and D expenditure incurred by the taxpayer. That's that's the direct uh, directly to do with the the IP. Uh, and B is stuff that you pay to somebody completely unconnected with you. So it's stuff that goes outside your little cosy arrangement here. C and D are payments that you pay inside this cosy arrangement here. So C is what this company pays that company to acquire the IP. So you're not taking that into account. You're effectively, that's reducing your formula, yeah? And D is, um, uh, uh, sorry, I got that the wrong way around. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, a and, uh, uh, sorry, forgive me. C and D are the external ones. A and B are the internal ones. Uh, I got, let me just work that out again, sorry. No, I was right the first time. A and B are the external ones. These are the good ones. And C and D are the kind of internal things that you're paying. You're paying uh, payments to related people, to related party outsourcing. So C and D are the things you're paying to related parties. So if in total this company has paid certain amounts to its connected company and it's paid certain amounts out this way, it's only getting a deduction for the proportion that relates to the third party uh, payments, not to the related ones. That's the point about that. Yeah, now, so that's a quick run through what the calculation So There is a suggested mechanism for calculating how you determine what proportion of, uh, what proportion of intellectual property that is in a particular uh, jurisdiction, what proportion of that can benefit from the tax regime of that place where it is. Um, that's how you do it with IP. Those, this whole push on substance was driven by the panic about the fact that companies could easily get profits offshore by putting IP into a different jurisdiction. That's obvious enough. But the same considerations apply for loads of other things as well. Because it's not just IP that you can put overseas, is it? Uh, in order to get profits flowing outside your company. You can have other structures as well uh, that produce a similar result. Um, you might have your headquarters in a particular place, but the rest of the functions of the business elsewhere. You might have a distribution service center in a particular place, but the rest of your functions elsewhere. You might have finance, fund management, banking, uh, transport, or a hold co in different jurisdictions compared to the other functions. You can put all sorts of bits of a particular entity into different jurisdictions, and there can be benefits with doing that. The point being that increasingly those benefits will only be available where any of those functions are real and do have proper substance in that particular in the jurisdiction where they find themselves. And it's still possible, though, to structure things so that you have a holding company in a good, in a good jurisdiction, taking into account the overall objectives of the group. It's still possible to structure things so you have an intellectual property company in a good jurisdiction. And it's still possible to structure things so that you have a finance company in a good jurisdiction from the point of view of tax. And I don't want anyone sort of getting the impression that because of the substance rules, this means you, you can't do this stuff. You're perfectly entitled to structure um, any commercial, any business, any kind of group, any kind of uh, enterprise in any way you want, uh, provided it's commercially justifiable. And OK, sometimes, let's be brutally honest, sometimes the tax consideration will come before the commercial consideration. That doesn't actually matter, provided the commercial consideration is met, provided what you've got there is actually real. And I'll talk about that in a couple of these examples. Let's just look at, so I said there, holding company 
IP company and a finance company, we're going to look at all three. We're going to look at different jurisdictions and different ways in which you might structure something like this. Okay. And let's look at a holding company first. Why would you, what's the point about a holding company? And do you remember this example? I think we gave this yesterday. You've got the, um, you've got, um, uh, you've got a Saudi company, a Saudi oil company uh, that's um, operating through a subsidiary in the US, so it's selling oil uh, in the US through this subsidiary. And can you remember why this was so bad? It's a 66% rate. Can anyone remind me why it's so bad? Or can they tell from the slide why the situation's so bad? Any volunteers? Just shout up, say a little louder. Uh, withholding tax on the dividends, was that what you said? Yeah, exactly right. What, and the, the, the cost really, ultimately, you've got, a corp, you've, got, well, you've got a corporate tax rate in the US, that's the big number, isn't it? Uh, so that's quite bad. But then we've got a dividend going up, and we've got a 30% withholding tax on the dividend as well. Um, what might you expect to limit that withholding tax? You're going to shout? Sorry? Double tax treaty. Thank you very much indeed. If, um, if anybody doesn't know that by now, uh, then I will have a little cry in the corner, if nobody minds. Um, the, uh, the double tax treaty. What does the double tax treaty between Saudi and the US say? I can recite the whole thing, and I will do that unless somebody answers. I will recite every word of the double tax treaty between the US and Saudi. What's the double tax treaty between the US and Saudi say? Right. I'm fed up with you. I'm going to recite the whole thing. Are you ready? Did you enjoy that? There isn't a double tax treaty between Saudi and the US, this whole point. And if you don't have a double tax treaty, then you can't have a limitation on that, can you? There's no, there's no mechanism for doing that. Or there wasn't a double tax treaty within Saudi and the US when I wrote this. Uh, that might be out of date because these things move quite fast. Because there's no double tax treaty, you, have a limit, you don't have a limitation on that withholding. So that's really why that's so bad. Um, so when you've got a situation like that, you might think, well, hang on, um, you know, is there any way you can sort of change the chain of companies to mean that actually you do uh, get something that, that improves the position? And yeah, you can. Oh, here we are, your Dutch company. Uh, you're on. Um, so uh, this would be a simple thing to do. Because um, what, what, just remind me, what does the tax treaty between Saudi and US say? Nothing, thank you very much indeed. These are easy questions, by the way. I always thought very easy questions. Uh, they're normally to check anyone still listening. Um, so um, uh, don't be ashamed of an easy answer. Um, OK. Um, guess what, though? Saudi, Saudi does have a double tax treaty with Holland, and Holland does have a double tax treaty with the US. So actually, if you interpose a holding company, you've instantly got yourself access to that double tax treaty, and that double tax treaty. It's kind of like saying, uh, well, we know you don't want to speak to us. We don't care. I'm going to use my mate over here who's got a double tax treaty with you, and she's going to pay me the money anyway, and I don't want to talk to you, but, but sorry, sorry to pick on you. It's nothing personal. I don't want to talk to you, but we talk to, you talk to each other, and we talk to each other, so that's fine. That's all you're doing, yeah? Um, is, that, is there anything wrong with that? Anything wrong with that? Could you just, sorry, I'm sorry, it's my hair. Thank you. Did, did everyone hear that? The company does not have a commercial purpose. There's no substance. That's exactly right. And if the company doesn't have a commercial purpose and it doesn't have any reality, then actually interposing it there, what you'll find is the limitation of benefit clause in the US double tax treaty with Holland now and the, uh, you, and the Dutch and Saudi uh, double tax treaties might mean you don't get a restriction on those withholding taxes. And actually, you might even find you're worse off because you might find you've got a double layer of deduction. Um, of uh, withholding taxes, in theory. You'd probably be relieved from that, but that might be what you get. Um, so, what does substance mean in this instance? Um, before we go, go on to that, we will, and we will talk about that in this particular... We'll talk about it in the case of the Dutch company. I'll, I'll ask some thoughts. Just before we go on to that, whoops. Um, quick quiz for you, and if you were very quick, you'll have seen the answers on that slide that I just flicked up by mistake. Um, quick question for you. Forget the deduction of withholding taxes and double tax treaties, and forget the fact that we're trying to just get 
uh, the advantage of, t of, of double tax, we're trying to effectively get the advantage of a double tax that doesn't exist, i.e. between the US and Saudi. Forget that for a moment. You're putting a holding company in a particular place. What are the considerations? What are you going to be thinking about? What's relevant? Think about all the things I've said this morning. Just jot down, anybody, just a couple of things. I'll give you one minute and just come up with things that are going to be relevant for deciding where a good place would be for a holding company. Okay, so over to you guys for one minute. Go. <laughs> Okay, um, that's definitely your minute up. What's, uh, can, anyone, can anyone suggest to me something that's important? We're trying to decide where to put a holding company. Can anyone give me an, a thought about what's important? Shout them out. Okay, great. Did you, everyone hear that? We had treaty network as one thing and low domestic tax rates. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so what, what holding company... What particular tax or tax on what will you be most... Thank you. Div tax on dividends. Everyone get that? If you're looking at a holding company, you're going to be worried about what, how the dividends received by that holding company are going to be taxed. And treaty network. Why does the treaty network matter? It doesn't matter. Who's bothered whether you've got a, a double tax treaty with another country? We're Saudi. We're not bothered that we don't have a double tax treaty with the US. Oh, blimey, yes, we are. Because we just identified a 66% tax rate because we didn't have a tax treaty. So exactly right. Anything else? Shout out anything. Sorry, madam. Uh, sorry, I, I heard a voice. Maybe, maybe uh, sorry. When the, when the, um, for the holding company, when the uh, interest income or the dividends income is exempted from taxation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, how the, is, there, is, there a, is there a participation exemption? Um, I mean, it's quite frequent in the case of dividend income, pretty rare in the case of interest receipt. But, yeah, is there, is there any kind of... So that's, that's very similar to the point made, how are dividends taxed? Yeah, anything else? Jessica, you had one, I think, there. Maybe you have to talk with substance. For example, you have employees, they're, like, straight to servicing the yeah. other... Great, yeah, so uh, can, you, uh, it, can you actually have substance there, yeah? Is this something, is this a place where you can have employees? So what are employee tax rates, for example? Because if you're going to, if you're going to need to access the treaty benefits and not have them be denied by limitation of benefits clause, then you might need to have employees there, yeah? So how does that apply? Yeah, okay, good, I'll give... Yeah, no, that, that's, I think that's a very good one. I don't, I think, in fact, I don't think I've got that on my slide. But, yeah, I mean, ultimately, who, where are the individuals uh, based and how are they actually going to benefit from this and how's, the, how's their residence affected? That's entirely right. I'll just zip, I'll just zip through it. Taxation dividends we had. Um, uh, withholding taxes on those, we sort of touched on that because of the treaty network and those two tying together. I've also put down their tax incentives. It may be that there were some, some actual advantages in having the holding company there because it gets some kind of tax repayment. Um, and this, this comes back to your point, madam. Uh, taxation of capital gains on shares. The shareholders... Um, how are they going to be taxed when they actually exit from this uh, holding company? So that, that might be significant. And how's the holding company going to be taxed if it sells the subsidiaries or the whole underlying group structure? Um, CFC rules are going to be important because if you have a holding company in a jurisdiction where you have particularly strong CFC rules, um, then what that might mean is that all the profits attributable to the the lower tax jurisdiction further down the net might end up in the top companies uh, in the top companies backyard, and transfer pricing rules will be significant as well um, because some of the transactions which you want to undertake using the holding company might be affected, overridden, whatever, by the existence of a strong transfer pricing um, regime. Now, um, here's a quick comparison of different uh, jurisdictions. Um, have a quick look at that. This is thinking about holding companies. It's not every consideration that we had down on that list, and there could be a hundred more. But just looking at that, where's a good place to have a holding company? I, I think I heard the answer. We need bravery, chaps. Cyprus, very good, yes. Yeah. Look, looks pretty good, doesn't it, on that? There will be other considerations. But if you have a holding company in Cyprus, you can get dividends in that without a tax charge. The holding company can sell the shares in the underlying group structure. There's no withholding tax. Uh, and uh, there's no CFC rules either. Um, actually, actually, 
if you're looking at a finance company, the UK is just as good, because there is a CFC rule, but there's a whopping great fat exemption for a proper finance function. So actually, our Dutch finance company would be fine. So, so what you I could hear bits of that. <laughs> what, you, what your colleagues are saying was that if you, I'll, I'll come over. Yeah. It's not a good idea to not open it in Cyprus because they tell me that uh, this period the tax authorities are making controls to the headquarters to see if there's headquarters there, to see if there are residents, if there are employees, and uh, so on. So Brilliant. Cyprus is not a good idea. I know. Uh, uh, no, that, I'm really glad you raised that because you say it's not a good idea. I'd slightly open our minds on that a little bit. It's, it's, it might still be a good idea, but subject to doing the right things. Ex no, exactly. But, that, and, but this is the point. You see, I think, uh, the, and this is my next question to you. And you've actually, in fact, actually, if you can shout out as an answer to this, the controls that you mentioned there in Cyprus. What is it that we need? What do you think? Where do considerations of substance fit in with that? So we're setting up a holding company in Cyprus. Tell me, just based on what you were just saying, then what? And shout out if you can. Uh, what actual headquarters? So in other words, premises. Bingo. Did, could everyone hear that? Uh, to have actual premises there, to have employees there, to have assets there, and to show that this isn't just what I'd refer to as a letterbox company. And this is the whole point. This is the other end of the extreme from a letterbox company, isn't it? The question is, how far do you have to go to have substance? You see, what you mentioned there, every client I'm dealing with at the moment wouldn't have a single problem with that. They would be fine with buying a property in Cyprus. Not every client. There are lots of clients that might be looking at using Cyprus as a holding company regime. They would be fine having genuine management base there. They would send executives out there to live there permanently. They would be fine with having actual financial backing for that company. They would be fine um, with complying with all the tax regulations within Cyprus. So the point I'm making is this, that, and this is, I've, I've I've, um, quite often you can sort of say, oh, oh there's, look, everybody, there's a rule there, blimey, we better not go anywhere near that then. Well, does that, is that right? It depends on what that rule says. It depends on how scary that is. It depends on what the penalties are. You've got to balance these things out, haven't you? The fact that there is a substance requirement, there was always a substance requirement. It was always possible for a court to look at something and say, we're just not buying this. We just don't believe this is real. We just don't believe this is what it's intended to do. This is a sham, and we're not going to give you the tax benefits that you claim to have achieved. Forget international uh, arena. It was always the possibility that people would do that. That's always been a risk, and having enough genuine commercial substance behind anything is actually key to making anything work um, with, with, that claims to get any kind, of tax, any kind of tax advantage. It hasn't really changed. It's just been emphasised by the flavour of some of the international discussion and been emphasised by some things that have gone into double tax treaties. But that's the whole point. And the, um, if, uh, it, I mean, the points that you made, it's probably as, probably as, good, as, you know, as good as any of the things I had in mind. Um, but just at this point, I'll pause and I'll tell you um, something that I found and my Dutch colleagues can leap in and say this is out of date or this is rubbish or whatever. Um, but this is the kind of thing you need as evidence. Um, because how far do you have to go? Does a company have to put all its employees there? I don't think so. Does it have to put all its production there? No. Does it have to put all of, um, all of its value there, all of its assets? Does, all, does every financial transaction have to go through that entity? Obviously not. That would be suggesting that you can't have a group. You can't have different companies within the group. So what is substance? How far do you have to go? 
And in, in some senses, this is obvious. In some senses, it's impossible to know. Um, because, you know, wh when have you done enough? And it's rather like um, the UK definition for residence, by the way, of a company is where the management and control of that company takes place. And the management and control is taken to be the kind of top-level decisions, not the day-to-day -day running of it. So you can have managers in the UK running around doing all the actual day-to-day -day running of something. The people that take the big decisions, if they're overseas, the management and control can be outside the UK. How real does that need to be? And I've, I've come across people who have gone to extremes to avoid falling within those rules. They've jumped on planes to make man decisions about what selling a subsidiary. They have gone on Eurostar and signed off the decision to sell a subsidiary while the Eurostar train was underneath the channel. I am not joking. Um, this is what people will do to make sure that they can demonstrate that management and control is outside the UK. How far do you have to go? And um, this is not clear. And the point is that with a, uh, with a finance function, a Dutch finance company, it was always the case, even before we had the more recent developments and the more recent recommendations from OECD, it was always the case that the recommendation would be make it real, make sure the company has some substance. And the kind of things we'd always say about a finance company, and it is normally a Dutch finance company, the kind of things we'd normally say about a finance company are, if that company's got a whole load of money and it lends it out to group companies, Make sure it genuinely gets a profit on it. Make sure you have some staff that are based in the Netherlands who are remunerated based on the profit that that company uh, has. Do not, under any circumstances, receive the money one day and pay it out the same day. Don't do that. Actively manage it. Have a, finance, have a treasury function going on. Have something genuine and real and have some individuals who know it's genuine and real because their big bonuses at the end of the year depend on it. All those things point towards there being substance. What does the word substance mean? What does substantial mean? Somebody define substantial for me. This is so unfair. English is my native language. It's the native language of only, I think, one other person in the room. Um, who can define substantial for me? Anybody. Well, the dictionary definition is of substance. And I've had this debate with HM Revenue and Customs. I've had the debate with uh, the local tax authorities. And this, the context of this was that they wanted to demonstrate that a tiny, tiny, tiny thing going on within a company was substantial for the purposes of a particular UK rule. And they were adamant that that was easy to prove because substantial means of substance. Of substance means anything but everything apart from stuff that is illusory, imaginary, uh, inconsequential. So substantial isn't that high a bar. Having substance isn't that high a bar. That's the point I would want to make. You've got to take it seriously, but it's not a block. It doesn't mean you don't do it. It doesn't mean you don't set up something. Uh, it just means that you have substance. And you know, the more substance something has, the more commercial benefit you're going to get from it, aren't you? Well, this is from um, Dutch uh, law. And what this is to do with, this is actually to do with whether or not you can have access uh, to the advanced pricing agreements under, under, um, uh, under uh, transfer pricing, I think. And um, only a company that is substantial in the Netherlands can do this. Okay, And this is what these rules in the Netherlands say. Now, this isn't... You know, this isn't international law, this isn't UK law, it's not German law, French law, or Croatian law. Oh, Croatian. Um, it's, um, this, is, this is purely what the Dutch regulation says. Not even Dutch law. This is actually just recommendations of the Dutch tax authorities. But what else do we go on? Well, let me just tell you what this says. Um, this says, at least half the managing directors are resident in the Netherlands. Well, fine. If you've got two managing directors of it, one of them's got to be resident in the Netherlands. Tick. The managing directors who are residing in the Netherlands have the professional skill required for the operation of the business. What's the business? Just remind me. What do we say this company is that we're setting up? It's, it's a holding company, actually. So they've got to have the sufficient skills to run a holding company, which, OK, depending on, what, depending on how it's set up, they may be relatively low. According to NASDAQ, I've got sufficient skills to be the financial expert on the board of a NASDAQ company. Go figure. Um, so, you know, the, the, um, basically, um, the, the, that's probably a relatively low barrier. 
Um, the, what else we got? Uh, the company has to have a real office in the Netherlands, very like the point that you were making, uh, Iona, about, um, about in, in Cyprus, that you have to have a real office there as well. Exactly, a letterbox company. Yeah, a let that's what we call a letterbox company, where you have several companies at the same address. We all know this. You go over to, go over to Jersey, you go, go to a solicitor's office, you walk in the front door, blimey, the wall is covered uh, th with all the companies of which that is the registered office. Guess what? Because none, really, none of them actually exist other than in name. Um, and they, have a, they might have a bank account, but that's about as far as it goes. Yeah, uh, so you've got to have a genuine premises there. So this is, remember, for the Dutch, uh, the Dutch rules. Um, the company has to have salaried employees, um, em employed officially. Okay, it uses the plural, employees, but that's salaried employees. Um, it doesn't say anything in terms of how they've got to be remunerated. The important management decisions must be taken in the Netherlands. Well, we just touched on that with things in the UK. Remember, what are the important management decisions in relation to a holding company? Um, to be honest, you probably have, if you're running a holding company, you probably have a pretty empty inbox, don't you? You come in on day one, uh, what, what's got to be done today? Nothing. It's all being undertaken within the group underneath. Have we received a dividend? No. I might clock off early. Um, so, you know, the important management decisions in respect to the holding company got to be taken there. Okay, fine. Um, the company, um, or the company must be. Uh, it, this is it must be new or have a good business. Have a good business history. I don't know what that means actually, um, but uh, um, but uh, th that's just the Dutch one. Uh, the company must pass successfully the compliance procedure. I think that means it's got to meet with all the normal compliance requirements. Um, the main bank account must be kept in the Netherlands. Okay. The bookkeeping must be done in the Netherlands. The company must have met its fiscal obligations. A uh, pretty bad idea if you're claiming to have a uh, holding company in a tax-favoured jurisdiction and you don't bother paying them the tax they are due. Uh, I think that would um, be rather silly. Um, so that should be easy to meet. Uh, the company is located in the Netherlands and must not be dual resident for tax purposes. Why would it? The capital, that's the equity of the company, must accurately reflect the activities performed by the company. Um, they're the requirements under Dutch guidance... Um, well, regulations, I think, that are provided to its tax authorities for determining whether it can accept that a company has substance uh, to get an advanced pricing agreement under transfer pricing. That's a specific purpose. But frankly, it's probably one of the best bits of evidence you can find for when something is real. My point is that don't, um, you know, don't assume that the, the substance requirement is a kind of block to using cross-border arrangements. Frankly, it's a blessing. It means that people will only use arrangements like this if they really have a reason for going into them. And, of course, guess what? Holland has now, the Netherlands, have now kind of created a little bit of a, a local industry in providing good financial functions. So there's an awful lot of expertise in the Netherlands about treasury functions, for example. So if you use an intermediate, uh, an intermediate holding company and you park money there, you'll find you've got ready access to better expertise for getting a better return on those tens of millions that are there and that being managed in an effective way than in other jurisdictions. That makes sense. Nothing wrong with that. So if you can find, if you can meet the, um, those kind of requirements, if you can have substance that really means something, then, um, um, then you can do you can still put in place structures that actually work. Now, oh, God, sorry, excuse me. Um, I shouldn't do that. Um, I'm probably going to have to run through the other slides a little quicker because I wanted to dwell on that point because do you all agree that's quite important, isn't it? In yes. term, sorry, it is important. And um, the Netherlands has sharpened these substance rules starting okay. from January 1st, 2018. Yeah. Um, it uh, has added that uh, there's a salary requirement for the employees. Yeah. And also, uh, yeah, in addition to uh, the office, you need to rent office space. Okay, great. So no letterbox uh, company. Fantastic. So, and that, again, I mean, to my mind, that's actually helpful rather than bad. I mean, I think when, when countries start saying, you've got to demonstrate taxable income of a million quid, yeah. um, and, or you've got, to, you've got to have 
200 employees, or you've got to, but I, I can't see that realistically happening. The extra requirements that are pointed out there is that there's a, there's a minimum salary requirement for, uh, for employees. Or is it a minimum salary requirement, or is it, a, is it a, um, just they have to be salaried, or? There's a minimum requirement. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a minimum total amount, and the company must act, the premises must be real. It can't just be a letterbox company. So it must be something that you lease, that you rent, or you own, and you can actually use as premises. Uh, so that's the requirement. Everyone happy with that, yeah? Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, hopefully everyone agrees that's, that's a useful bit of thinking, because, you know, I just want to dispel the idea that just because something, um, you know, just because there's a requirement for there to be substance there, um, that means that we can't use it. So I'm very grateful to you for raising the point about Cyprus because that illustrates it beautifully. And it's interesting that you put it in that way. My colleague said it's a bad idea. Yeah, so, um, but I think, I think the point is that it's, it's definitely a consideration. It's really important to be aware of it. And it's really important that we're all aware of that. But... Um, the, um, uh, but it's not the end of the story. And, you know, I mean, you can still have um, an intellectual property company. There are commercial reasons for having an intellectual property company, for putting the intellectual property into one place. Genuine commercial reasons. If you separate the intellectual property into a company where it's not dealing with the end users and not dealing with people who might sue the company or might have some reason to litigate against the company, then they might not be able to litigate against the company owning the IP. Your most valuable asset might be protected in the event of some action against, against the company. And so, you know, there are... Um, uh, we've looked at the restriction on where you're getting a deduction for payments in respect of royalties on intellectual property, and that will be under most countries' jurisdictions and looking at most double tax treaties, either now or in the future, that will be limited to the expenditure that's gone on in that country. But subject to that, an intellectual property company still can make complete sense. Uh, and we've touched on lots of these in order to demonstrate the substance. Do we, have, do we have staff there? Do we have operations that are actually being carried on there? And this kind of stuff is history. Um, trying to claim a company's got substance just because it has an address, a letterbox company. Trying to claim a, a company has got substance just because board meetings happen to take place once a year in a particular nice jurisdiction um, and there's a standard note produced to those. That isn't enough. They, there does need to be substance, but the substance rules aren't necessarily as onerous as people imagine them to be. Everyone happy with that, yeah? Okay, and... Um, we can equally have, so we can have a holding company, we can have an intellectual property company, we can have a finance company, again, subject to all of the points about substance that we were talking about. And having a finance company can have lots of advantages because you can put that in a jurisdiction where there is the right kind of expertise to make sure that that company is uh, leveraging off that expertise and getting the best possible returns and the best possible cash flows. And I mean, I've got to say, this is way beyond my understanding, but it's for banking experts and financial experts. But I'm told that when you do have companies in the Netherlands, there are, there are added advantages to do with financial security. There are added advantages to do with... Um, uh, to do with just, just the, 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 the flow of money and the speed at which transactions can be done. I don't know how they come about or how they end up being in that position where they can access that, uh, but that's obviously a commercial reason for wanting to use that as a, as a base. Um, one point I'd make is that, remember we talked yesterday about, um, we talked yesterday about uh, restrictions of the deductibility so wait, of interest charges. So we've got a finance company. There will be, under lots of local jurisdictions rules, a restriction on the amount, the maximum amount for which you can get a deduction. And that will normally be geared towards the profitability, the, uh, the EBITDA. Um, so, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, so this is, this is the, the income before... Um, uh, interest uh, um, uh, depreciation and amortization. Um, so, 
uh, it, it's getting a, a proportion of that either on a single company basis or taking into account the group um, income, so it's earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Um, so uh, it will normally be, uh, most countries' rules will uh, now apply a restriction on that based on that. So in the UK, for example, the maximum you can get is 30% of that EBITDA number, but subject to that, um, and subject to the substance points that we're talking about, using a finance company still, still, um, um, still makes sense. And that is completely consistent with the OECD's objective here. The objective is that what, if you're sticking a whole load of capital in a particular group member, you're only getting, just actually putting it there doesn't really count for anything. You're actually looking at um, uh, that uh, you know, you've got to align the returns and the value creation. If you're creating instead a finance function that actually can make its own money, that can reward its employees for the profits that it's making, it does have, it puts that money at risk while it owns it to some extent, and then all of that actually is still consistent with that BEPS um, uh, objective. And all of these are things that we've, um, we've, we've, we've kind of covered off this slide already, and thank you for sharing. We've had two people sharing their experience on this particular thing. So we've had Cyprus and the Netherlands as examples of where we can look at what the substance requirements of those jurisdictions look like. Um, and, um, but my main point is that the days of pretending you've got a company, setting up a company which is a letterbox company, just a name, just, uh, just an address that's used by thousands of other companies, just a bank account, the days of having that and using that as part of fiscal planning are gone. Um, and not a bad thing. Um, the days of using a finance company as part of fiscal planning are not gone, provided you're in a position to mean that you staff it properly, you have the right manpower there, you give it the right functions, you give it a genuine purpose, and it genuinely does something for you. And why not? Because all the problems I come across are when people have done something purely for tax purposes. All the good stuff I've come across is where people have done something that actually has a really good spin-off tax benefit. Yeah? I'm not going to go through that example because the reason I'm not going to go through that example is when I came to look at that last night, after I got back from the pub, I couldn't remember what it was about uh, and I couldn't work it out. Um, so if you want to have a look at that in your slides and tell me what that is about, that would be great. Um, it's actually quite a, quite a complex thing to do with the recognition of interest and uh, competitive equity and how that fits in with the double tax treaty. So we'll skip over that if you don't mind. And the point is that substance, the substance rules... Going right back, we talked about what are the substance rules, what are these rules? Well, the OECD recommendations, there are changes to double tax treaties, so there are limitation of benefit rules in double tax treaties. There isn't a set of substance rules that are in a book that everyone reads. They're spread all over the place, and they're appearing in different places coming out of the OECD BEPS initiative, yeah? Um, but they also reflect in all of this legislation, so all of the anti-avoidance legislation that we've already touched on. These all have somewhere echoes of the substance rules. And, um, um, and you know, this is, again, in line, and if, if they don't, they will have in line with the actions 8 to, eight to 10 of BEPS, because BEPS, uh, those actions were saying what you should be doing in your transfer pricing rules is ensuring that you're aligning the transfer pricing outcomes with the value creation. I don't know why there's a big gap there, um, but that's what you're supposed to be doing. In other words, you're valuing the transfer pricing outcomes with the commercial reality of what is going on. And the all of transfer pricing policy should be driven by what is real and not just what is legally on paper there. So all of these anti-avoidance rules reflect that uh, substance uh, requirement. And so this is the other place where the substance rules are, if you like, this way they manifest themselves. And a transaction must have economic purpose and not be solely to reduce tax exposure. Um, there isn't, like I say, these rules, there isn't a rule book about substance. There isn't a, look, here it is. That's why we have to go looking at, for example, what the Dutch regulations say about what is, uh, what, when a company has substance for Dutch tax purposes or specific Dutch tax purpose. But that's all we have. They're the only things that we have to go on. Um, and uh, you've got the same thing in thin capitalization rules. Um, uh, uh, the point is that the rules allow you to re-characterise something in accordance with the substance. 
Um, and so uh, where you're stuffing a company full of money, what that might mean is if you're stuffing a company full of money um, and it's lending back, you might say, well, why has it done that? Um, it's absolutely fine. You have actually put the money into the company that you've used as the finance function, but why did it bother lending it back at those rates? And why didn't you just keep the money in the first place? So if you've got that kind of arrangement, while you might satisfy the substance requirements for a particular jurisdiction, you might be caught by thin cap rules uh, or other anti-avoidance rules, including the GAR, where actually you haven't got a reason for doing it in the first place. So this is the other place where this substance argument comes out. So even though you tick the boxes for actually having an entity with employees, with a genuine address, look at the other anti-avoidance rules as well, because all of them do contain references to substance which might make a difference to this. And actually, I'll give that example of, of, of uh, lending. Um, because if you've got a situation where, in this example, a borrower obtains an actual loan of £100 million from a non-arm's length source, but would only be able to, uh, to borrow £60 million at arm's length, um, if you've then got that replicated in an intergroup situation, the transfer pricing rules would normally say, and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, think capitalisation rules would actually would say that you're only getting a deduction for a proportion of that interest. Um, and this is based on these arguments. Has anyone come across this concept, the would and could arguments, where you're looking at borrowing and deductibility of borrowing costs? Does it mean anything to anybody? Okay, a couple of nods. The point about these arguments is that um, you can have situations where you've got intergroup borrowing. So we set up a finance company. Let's say that's a finance company, and it's lent that money back to that company there and uh, this company is claiming a deduction on the interest, right? So you've got that situation, and you might say, uh, well, all of that is fine, all of that does have the correct substance, all of that is legally and economically real because we're applying a genuine interest rate. Yeah? Convincing. Yeah? So that's actually quite good. Um, the OECD guidelines on most legislation, most anti-avoidance legislation in this area, insists that we go further than that. We need to look at it from the point of view of the borrower and the point of view of the lender. And we need to ask from the point of view of the borrower, could the borrower really have borrowed that money? And in the example I've given, the answer is no. They couldn't really have borrowed that money. They couldn't give the right security for it. They couldn't give the right guarantees for it. They couldn't actually prove that they'd be in a position to service the debt year on year. So could the borrower really have borrowed that money? And the second test you then ask is you look at it from the point of view of the lender. And you say, even if the borrower could have borrowed that money, would the lender have lent them that money? Now, it did in our example, with a very artificial, non-substantial arrangement where all we do is take money from there, we capitalise this company, and then we just lend the money back. Would it have actually lent the money there? Um, well, on the return we're getting on the uh, formal interest, on the official interest rate, the answer would be no. Uh, it could have done way better things with that money. Um, and... Um, it would just have no reason for picking that particular borrower as a customer of its lending function. So you've got to pass, where you're looking at debt arrangements, forget the, subs, uh, in addition to proving the substance of the entities in the jurisdictions, you've got to look at these kind of arguments to make sure you don't then fall foul of other anti-avoidance rules which would undo the tax benefits of having the tax deduction that would otherwise be there. Uh, I'm flicking through these because I want to get you off a little early, if I possibly can. Um, this is all to do with the, OE, to do with the, um, the building blocks of CFC rules. And again, the CFC rules do echo the requirement for there being substance. Um, and one thing that the OECD has got a little bit upset about is in the case of the UK rules, um, or the EU rather has got a little bit upset about, is in the case of the U EU rules, are they being too generous? on companies that carry on a finance function because on the controlled foreign company rules under, under UK law, you can get into a big fat exemption if you've got a company, a subsidiary that is carrying on a finance function. And uh, the, U, the UK is being investigated um, uh, as to whether we are giving discriminatory treatment and we're giving effectively state aid uh, to UK companies in setting up um, in certain jurisdictions. This is the final place where, so just, just recapping, 
th there is no rule book for substance. Where does substance actually appear? Substance appears in the OECD guidelines. It appears in um, individual uh, bits of tax legislation, tax anti avoidance legislation. It appears in du and double tax treaties, and this is where it appears in double tax treaties, in limitations of benefit clauses. So in limitations of benefit clauses, um, the idea is that you only get the benefits, you only get the restrictions that are provided under the double tax treaty in terms of what the withholding tax might be on a particular payment if the thing that is going on if the interrelation between the two companies has some genuine economic reality and has some substance. So this is, this is probably the main place where the substance rules really figure at the moment. Outside domestic legislation, this is the main place where they figure. We've touched on all this. What is substance? Um, and uh, important point here, uh, there's no agreement um, on the word substantial, and this is quite this is this is the this is a good thing for us and a bad thing for us. It means we can't be certain in what we're saying to people, but probably it means we have got opportunities um, that prima facie are things that we can pursue. So just for running through these, uh, you know, um, do you have an active trade or business? Do you have something actively going on in the jurisdiction? And going back to my Dutch finance company uh, example, if you've got people that really are undertaking a treasury function and investing the money in the right kind of way, yeah, then you probably do have an active trade or business. Um, and uh, let's have a look. Um, yeah. Uh, and do you have something that's more than uh, incidental income to a trade or business? So, um, do you have, this is the point, do you actually have substantial income coming from what you're doing? And there isn't any definition of that, but you can assume that if you're undertaking a finance function, if you're making a reasonable return on the finance that is, is your job, on the money that is your job to invest, then I think you can demonstrate that you're making substantial income on that. Um, I won't go through that example. I'm sorry to flick through these guys, but the, um, this is a little longer than some of the other ones. Um, what's the only thing I need to bring out for you? Okay, I will go through this actually. Um, Luxembourg can be home for IP. I think I've mentioned this. So for IP companies, Luxembourg has, has kind of has kind of been putting itself forward really as um, a good place for people to put uh, intellectual property companies and there are certain tax incentives that exist within Luxembourg tax law to mean that there can be advantages in having a company that owns intellectual property. And um, if you are trying to work out, if you're relying on the US Luxembourg tax treaty and you're trying to work out whether what you've got um, is, um, is um, actually within these, then there's a safe harbour. There's basically, if you can pass these tests, then what you've got in that situation is actually substantial for these purposes. And it's a ratio test. Under the ratio test, income earned by the Luxembourgian entity is considered substantial if value of assets held by the entity, the gross income derived from the activity, payroll expenses related to the trade and the business is at least 7% in the preceding year when compared against the US trade, so 7.5% in the preceding year when compared against the US trade or business. Well, that's quite useful, isn't it? It means that if you are setting up a Luxembourgian company, uh, which is going to hold uh, well, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even need to be an IP company. It doesn't need to be something uh, doing business in Luxembourg. You've actually got to have some profit, some income of that. There's got to be a significant, I would say, significant proportion of what the US company earned the previous year. Yeah? Everyone see that? But I say that at 7.5%, um, it's not... You know, it's not that high, and all the average of all three factors must exceed 10% in the pre, in the preceding year. So that's an actual numerical test that applies in the case of the U.S. Luxembourg Treaty. And again, to to my mind, that points towards, although the requirements of substance are real. Excuse the pun. Although the requirements of substance can't be ignored, although these are quite important, they're not insurmountable they're actually quite achievable so long as what you're prepared to do is enter into a structure that really does do something. Everyone agree with that, yeah? 
Because I don't think I don't think that's you know if you're saying it had to be half the income, if you're saying it had to be the majority of the profit, uh, then that would be a different thing. But it's saying it's seven point five percent. Um, and there's an example there which you can read uh, that just just puts puts numbers on. Well, it just talks through that, but it doesn't actually put numbers on it, so I won't bother going through that at all. Um, I wanted to get you off a little bit early, so I will go to questions now because it is uh, coming up to quarter past, and I was hoping to have you done in an hour, and I failed miserably. Um, so, does anyone have any questions on what we talked about? Just to summarise, uh, what this session was about was about. Um, there are various requirements for substance for there the, to be a reality uh, to any transactions, to be a reality to any entities that you're using in any kind of structure. There always were those requirements. This is nothing new. They've just been brought into focus by the OECD recommendations as they are reflected in some double tax treaties and in some limitation of benefits clauses in double tax treaties. They've also been reflected in particular bits of legislation, um, particular bits of anti-avoidance legislation, and we have limited guidance and limited knowledge about what substantial means in this instance. So those requirements have always been around, they've been brought into more focus, and we've got to take them more seriously. Well, no, we now know we've got to take them seriously, we actually always did. Um, and we've got limited guidance on when, knowing whether or not we are over the right side of the line or the wrong side of the line. But we've got some guidance. And there's a couple of examples that we saw. We saw the Dutch example, and we saw the US Luxembourgian double tax treaty example. The word substantial, under the Oxford English Dictionary definition, just means something that is more than imaginary, illusory, or not of substance. So it's something real. So that's a quite low threshold. Um, so given that, um, yes, we need to take these all seriously. They are not a block on international tax planning. What they are is a reminder that if you're going to set up any structures, make sure you're actually getting a commercial benefit from them. And frankly, if you're not doing that, you shouldn't really have been doing it in the first place. Because if you really are just setting up an Isle of Man letterbox company, you're asking for trouble, and you always were. This just reminds you of it.